Let me begin by saying happy pride and that every person in this beautiful church and online is fearfully and wonderfully made and beloved by God. Today is the first Sunday of June and the launch of a month-long pride celebration. It is a time to celebrate the riches that being a part of a diverse community brings and to honor the many battles our LGBTQ plus friends, family, and allies have fought and won over the decades. But it is also a time to remember that the battle is not yet over. If we look at our world today, our nation, and around the globe, people are becoming more and more divided and polarized. There are so many lines being drawn, and this division is not new. Since the beginning of time, people in power have oppressed, exploited, and ostracized people they consider or see as less than as inferior. This division ensures that certain groups are given preferential treatment based on money, power, and specific demographics, while others are exploited, oppressed, and forced to live in the margins of life. The real tragedy of all of this is this discrimination exists within the church. As an ordained clergy person, I apologize. To everyone under my voice and in my heart, I apologize for the hurt and suffering caused by the church and by all denominations that are not open and affirming and inclusive. God forgive us all. I believe that any criteria used to divide people is not the way of Jesus Christ. Christian theology says that all human beings are made in God's image. And the operative word here is all. What does the gospel say about this division? How are we as Christians to characterize, quantify, and react to discrimination in any form, and that includes homophobia. Sacred history and the scriptures reveal a God who is ultimately no respecter of persons and has the same loving concern for all humanity. As one colleague of mine says, and I quote, God is concerned about the healing of the body, the cleansing of the soul, and the perfecting of the spirit, and the transformation of society. This morning, I wish to lift up to you a story of a woman who carries on her back the burden of ethnic, religious conflict, exploitation, gender, and class struggles. She is the Samaritan woman who finds God's healing grace and faith through an encounter with Jesus Christ. Won't you pray with me? Holy One, today we celebrate pride. We come to you now for a time of learning and reflection. For those with aching hearts, may this time be one of healing. May we all draw closer to you. And this and all things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. There are many famous sayings by Hillel, the great Jewish religious leader, sage, and scholar, who said, and I quote, what is hateful to you, do not do to others. The rest 
is commentary. Go and learn it. So today I want to lift up a different learning or a different perspective about the Samaritan woman who meets Jesus at the well. She is evidence of the outsider turned insider through grace, faith, and the inclusivity of the gospel. Historically, within the Christian community, the Samaritan woman has been defamed by negative interpretations of this story. I want to bring a new light, if you will, to this old story. Now our reading begins with Jesus, who is tired and thirsty, sitting at a historic well in Samaria. Wells, as you might know, are significant in the Bible. They are essential for life in Israel's very, very hot and dry climate. This particular well is a historical site for Jews and Samaritans as it is near the plot of ground that their ancestor Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Wells are also the meeting place, the hangout place for the community. But Jesus and the woman are alone. Jesus' disciples are off shopping for food, and the woman is for some reason that the text does not tell us. She's drawing water alone in the heat of the day. Now this simple act of their meeting and Jesus speaking to this Samaritan woman is an important detail, and it is one that we should not overlook. You see, speaking to a Samaritan woman alone in public without other women or a male family member present is scandalous. This act performed by Jesus with this woman, this act shatters cultural and religious taboos based on race and gender. It is also proof that Jesus has the power to transform this woman's life, and I'll get to that in a moment. Our reading begins with, again, Jesus sitting alone by a well. He's thirsty and he's tired. He is traveling from the south to the north, but Jews, rather than go the direct route to avoid Samaria, they would take the long way around the river Jordan. But Jesus does not do that. He decides that he must go through Samaria. And he's there sitting alone when a woman comes to draw water. The author tells us, as you heard read so beautifully, it's about noontime, the hottest point in the day, and the woman is by herself. She's an outsider, isolated from her community, and is not with other women, drawing water and sharing the local gossip in the cool of the morning or in the cool of the evening. She's an outcast isolated from her community when she meets this stranger, this foreigner, a Jewish man who asks her for a drink of water. As a Samaritan and a Jew, they are the product of hatred and rivalry between their ancestors. That is recorded in 2 Kings. I commend you to read it at a later time. Their ancient and volatile history begs the question, why is Jesus even in Samaria and asking a Samaritan woman for a drink of water? Now she too is astonished by the gesture and says, how is it that you, a Jew, asks a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? The answer which is not given explicitly, but which is implicit 
in the story is that, is that neither her gender nor her nationality matter to Jesus. Jesus sees a human being with a yearning to quench her thirsty soul. A woman who is not outside the activity of God, the heart of God, or the grace of God. The woman has a bucket, but no water. And Jesus has no bucket, but has living water. Somewhere deep within this woman's soul, she's being drawn in and she wants to learn more about this man and what he has to say in this living water. What is it? Jesus offers the Samaritan woman something more than ordinary drinking water from the well. He offers her a gift, a gift she knows not of the gift of living water. The woman pursues the conversation with an open heart and says, sir, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Jesus offers this living water to everyone, even to a Samaritan woman, a woman who knows rejection, a woman who's ready now for a life-changing event to ease the humiliation of five husbands and the reputation of living with a sixth man who is not her husband. One womanist theologian who advocates for this nameless woman writes, and I quote, we have 42 verses of scripture which is the longest portion of dialogue between Jesus and any other one person in all of the Gospels. Just three of those verses, 16 through 18, deal with the woman's husbands. It's time to stop. End of quote. As the conversation progresses, Jesus asks her, go get your husband, fetch your husband, bring him here. The woman ignores the strangeness of the encounter and the request that she bring her husband. She ignores it. What is important and not obvious from the text is that Jesus knows the woman has no husband. And the woman acknowledges this truth. She says, sir, I have no husband. With that brief exchange between Jesus and the woman, there is a monumental breakthrough that points to grace and points to faith. She addresses Jesus as teacher and then prophet and finally as Christ. The Samaritan woman stands before the Messiah with hope now in her heart. Jesus turns this woman's midnight into day. And she knows this living water is for her and for all who thirst. This woman is undeterred by the socio-political and the ethnic and religious rivalry between Samaritans in the north who worship at the temple of Mount Gerizim and the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus ignores the divisions of his day between women and men and Samaritans and Jews. Demographics mean nothing to him. It is the woman's faith that gives unmistakable evidence to Jesus that she yearns to drink this living water and she's ready to experience a new life. What matters, you want to know what matters, is a new loyalty, that is to worship in spirit and in truth. After this miraculous encounter at the well, the Samaritan woman leaves her bucket behind and her old life behind at the well 
and with pride and joy, she witnesses to her community. She is a person who has met God in the flesh, face to face through Jesus Christ. She does not simply tell her community who Jesus is, she invites them to discover his healing power for themselves. Samaritans and Jews can worship together. Men and women can worship together. All are welcome to drink from God's grace-filled well of life. The heart of God is grand and glorious enough to affirm the dignity of every woman, man, and child, then and now. Every member of the LGBTQ plus community. The gospel illuminates the ultimate unity of humankind. The blessing to all who celebrate this month with joy in the knowledge that they belong. On this first Sunday of Pride, we give thanks to the many ways love finds us. Jesus is inclusive and invites everyone to quench their thirst for liberation and freedom. Freedom of spirit with living water. That is, all of us, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, two-spirited, intersex, asexual, pansexual, gender, cisgender female, cisgender male, plus every non-conforming ancestor who has gone before us. This gospel invites us to follow in Jesus' footsteps with faith and to lean in into courage into courageous acts of sacred resistance, which is a testimony to the limitless love and grace of God, the God who creates us all. Thanks be to God. Amen.